progressive revelation. These verses are perhaps the clearest expression in the Bible of the doctrine commonly known as progressive revelation. Progressive revelation accounts for the fact that not all divine truth knowable by believers today was always available, nor was it always knowable in spite of being present in the Scripture. What Adam and Eve knew about God's truth was, arguably, much less than what believers today may come to know, provided, of course, they devote themselves to the process of spiritual growth, reading their Bibles, seeking out a good source of truth, and consistently exposing themselves to solid doctrinal teaching. On a regular basis, actually believing the truth they hear, applying this truth to their day-by-day -day Christian lives, and helping others do the same through the proper function of their own gifts, once they become spiritually mature. What we can say from the mention of the coats of skin prepared for Adam and Eve by God in Genesis 3.21 is that even from the start of humanity's exit from paradise, the gospel was presented. The sacrifice of the animals necessary to produce our first parents' new coverings represented our Lord's death for all sin and was the standard way of presenting God's solution to the sin problem before and after the giving of the law until the reality of the cross. For this reason, Genesis 3.21 is often called the Proto-Evangelium, or first giving of the Gospel. The fundamental difference between the Gospel then and now is that before the cross mankind looked forward to God's solution without full knowledge of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. 1 Peter 1.11, but rather more through a glass darkly, 1 Corinthians 13.12, whereas now after the cross we see Jesus Christ clearly portrayed as crucified, Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. In either case, faith in God's salvation, trusting Him that He would deliver from sin all those who put themselves into His hands, is the essence of responding to the gospel so as to be saved. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us will fall asleep, but all of us will be changed in that moment of time, in the blink of an eye, at the final trumpet blast. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will rise incorruptible, and we too, that is, believers still alive, will be changed at that time, that is, the Lord's second advent return. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 This is a mystery, because prior to the revelation given to Paul, Scripture did not distinguish the phases and circumstances of the resurrection as it now does. It was merely revealed in the past that the dead would rise, some to life and some to condemnation. For many who sleep in the dust will awake, some to eternal life, but the others to shame and eternal separation from God. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 Now, however, we know more as God has caused His revelation of these matters to us to progress so that now we understand all about the phases of the resurrection of the righteous. 1. Christ. 2. The Church, including those departed and those alive at Christ's return. And 3. The millennial believers, or friends of the bride. But each will be resurrected in his own echelon. Christ is the first fruits. Next will be those belonging to Christ at his coming, that is, the second advent. Then the end, when he will hand the kingdom over to the Father, after he has brought an end to all rule, all power, and all authority. For he must rule until he has placed all his enemies under his feet, and death is the final enemy to be done away with. 1 Corinthians 15, 23-26 Please note carefully, however, that the truth has always been the same. The truth has not changed. What has changed is that God in his grace has allowed us to know more details about the wonders to come, as the revelation of His truth to the people of God through the Holy Spirit, now given to us all, has progressed from the shadows of the law to the reality of His grace revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Even angels want to look into these things. 1 Corinthians 2.12-16 When you read these things, you will be able to understand my spiritual insight into this mystery of Christ, which was not made known to mankind in previous generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And the mystery is this, that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, members of the same body and equal partakers of the promise of salvation to Israel in Christ Jesus through the gospel, the proclamation of his victory. It is of this gospel that I have been made a minister by the gift of God's grace given to me through his dynamic power. To me, the least of all his holy ones, 
this gracious charge has been entrusted to proclaim to the Gentiles the unfathomable wealth that is Christ and to shed light on this mystery, the calling out of the Gentiles which is now being brought to pass, literally, the dispensation of it, though it was once hidden from the ages in God who created everything. God did this so that his enigmatically intricate wisdom might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, that is, the angels, through the agency of the church, according to his plan for the ages, that is, history, which he has implemented in the person of Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 4 through 11 Angelic interest I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Luke chapter 15 verse 7 Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Luke chapter 15 verse 10 Our Lord's words here make it plain that the spiritual battlefield through which we walk here on earth is under very close heavenly observation, for the angels take great interest in every victory. More than that, angels are also said to aid and assist believers in our spiritual combat. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 These matters have been covered before. What concerns us here is not angelic interest in the tactical details of the unseen conflict raging around us, nor their involvement therein, but the astounding wonderment they experience about the overall plan of God which has wrought absolute victory in the coming and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Moreover, the key thing the angels find of interest is said to be the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Now the spiritual death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for the sins of the entire world absolutely is the most interesting thing ever to take place in either human or angelic history. The cross, after all, is the foundation of the entire plan of God, and the least part of what Christ did for the least sinner when he died for the person's sins on Calvary surpasses in importance, awe and wonder the entirety of anything and everything in the totality of that creature history combined to an unimaginable magnitude. All of Satan's efforts before the cross, therefore, were focused on preventing it, and all of his efforts after the cross are focused on diminishing its effect. And just as the angels were highly interested in how the problem of sin could and would be resolved by the sufferings of Christ, so they are now interested in the after-effects of that supreme sacrifice, the glories that would follow, which glory we all enter into when we follow the Lord the way he intends us to do carrying our cross. When we share his sufferings, Romans chapter 8 verse 17 and 2 Corinthians 1 5, we enter into the culmination of the plan of God which is set upon the rock of the Saviour and his death for us. This is indeed something which interests the angels fallen and elect. The former are interested in stopping us from following Christ and are thus only too eager to do what they can to make us suffer. The latter are interested in the power of the sacrifice of Christ and in the powerful forward progress for him believers who now have the Holy Spirit are making, in his behalf, aiding us in all ways in which they are legitimately allowed. What we should take from this blessed insight given to us by the Word of God is that we are not merely isolated individuals plugging away here in the world. Rather, we believers are all integral parts of the body of Christ, which is being opposed by the evil one and his legions at every step, but which is being aided in that struggle by the holy angels in just the right way. We are not only a part of the unseen angelic conflict swirling around us, we are the focal point as representatives of the one whose bride we are, our dear Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ.